We'll read a couple, three verses from here, then go to Genesis chapter 11. But Genesis chapter 10, beginning in verse 8, says this. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Eric, and Akkad, and Kama in the land of Shinar. So here's a man named Nimrod, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then in Genesis chapter 11, it tells us about the tower of Babel. It says, now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they soldiered east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower, whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Verse 6, The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. This is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Verse 7, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, talking about the Trinity there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there... The Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. There are certain characters in literature, by literature I mean literature in general, I'm not just talking about the Bible here, but there are certain characters in literature that when you hear their names, you associate certain things with them. If I was to say that somebody was like Pinocchio, you might think that them and the truth had an aversion to one another, right? Because you know the story and about the nose that grows, you know. There are some people, you know how... Uh, you know how they're telling the lies if their lips are moving, right? And, and you might you might say that that's you might associate that with a character like Pinocchio. You might say someone's a narcissist. Anybody ever heard that word before? If you're not familiar with that, narcissist in mythology is a mythological man that was so in love with himself that he looked at his he looked at uh, in the water and saw his his uh, uh, reflection coming back, and he was so enamored by himself that he just stayed there forever. And how many know there's a lot of people that do that sort of thing, right? They are so enamored with themselves that they just stay there, and, and they're always focused upon themselves. Every conversation comes down to them. Everything must begin and end with them. And if you want to hear about something about them, just ask them, and they'll tell you, right? And so we, we associate certain things with that sort of thing. Atlas might be lesser known. He's a mythological figure too, but known very strong and carrying the world. If you say, it used to be a term back years ago, someone's like a Mr. Atlas meant that they were, they were strong. Well, tonight we're going to look at three different, uh, not very well known Bible characters, but these aren't just characters in literature. These are people that really existed because the Bible tells us about history. And we're going to look here and see the first one we studied is Nimrod. Nimrod comes in Genesis chapter 10, and he is the founder of this place called Babel. And uh, many of the uh, uh, scholars, both Jewish and Christian, associate Nimrod with being the guy that, or, that orchestrated this effort to build the Tower of Babel. And if you're familiar with scripture, is that God had told the people that they would be fruitful and multiply and spread out over the face of the whole earth. And of course, what did mankind do? They did exactly the opposite. They stayed in one place and they said, we're going to stay here. We don't want to, want to be scattered across. We really don't want to obey God. The name Nimrod, by the way, if you go and you were to purchase one of those Bible cards with the name Nimrod and watch it. Anybody know anybody here named Nimrod? Anybody know? Probably not. There's a good reason about that, okay? But if you were to go at the Christian bookstore and buy the Bible name card Nimrod underneath it, it would mean, we shall rebel. And how many know that's what they did? They rebelled against God, and Nimrod was seen as the leader of this rebellion. How did they rebel against God? They did not obey the word of God. And they joined together, and they began to build this tower of Babel. And what did they want to do? They wanted it to go to the heavens, 
not necessarily uh, thinking that they were going to get into the place where God resides, that sort of heaven, but they wanted to go as high as they could to make a name for themselves. How many know that's what everybody that rebels against God, what are they doing? They are rebelling against... Uh, when they, when they, you may talk to people, they may not think that they're rebelling against God, but if they're rebelling against His Word, that's rebelling against God, right? If it is that I had a student today, and I said I, I gave them a paper to do, and it's kind of a long story, but I gave them a paper to do, and guess what? I even gave them the answer sheet, and I said, now you do that so you can you can get a grade in here, and this student didn't make any move. I said. So are you refusing to do what I didn't say? It, that's how I wanted to say it. I said, I said yeah. so are you refusing to do what I asked you to do? She says, she, the student replies, says, did I get up and say that I refused to do? <laughs> now it came to it, and she said it just like that. I said, Lord, self-control, got Holy Spirit. <laughs> And, uh, I, and I, I, didn't, I didn't go ballistic or postal or whatever you know. I didn't do that. And here it is. And she's there and she, she wasn't doing it. But she didn't see that as refusing because she didn't say, I refuse. But how many know she was refusing? If she's refusing the word that was given, okay, then she's refusing to do as she was asked to do. Even if she doesn't flat out say, I refuse. How many know that's what people that don't submit to Christ People that reject God's word, they are rejecting God. They're refusing him, himself. And here it is, these people, they're rejecting what God said do. They're not going out across the face of the earth. They want to make a name for themselves. Perhaps they think, as did Satan, that they would somehow actually build a tower, perhaps, into the heavens. And somehow they would show that they would show God what was up, so to speak. And what did they do? They continued to build this tower. And in my mind's eye, I tell you, you think, sometimes we have this, uh, this uh, misunderstanding in our mind. that We think that just because people lived a long time ago back in the book of Genesis, probably because we've been taught certain things by secular history, we think of, of that they don't know much and they can barely do anything. Go and look. Our brother was just here and his family went to the ark uh, uh, museum that's in Kentucky. I might have heard of that before. They got the Creation Museum. They got the Ark. And they did a model of the Ark as depicted in Scripture. It is a huge structure. And they most likely didn't have craftsman tools and all this sort of thing and power and electric. But they built it. It's not because they were a bunch of dummies, so to speak. They obeyed the Word of God and they knew what to do, and they did it, and it's a huge thing that would be something to pull off, and that was Genesis chapter 6, right, beginning there, no, we're in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, these folks, they're building this tower, and they're building it higher and higher and higher, and I can just see Nimrod and those that he gathers together with him, I can see them in my mind's eye as they build it, and it goes one brick upon another brick. One story upon another story. One day goes to another day, goes to another week, and perhaps another month. And we don't know the timetable, but it's such a timetable that the tower is getting taller and taller and taller and taller. And I can see them thinking, hmm, God told us to spread out over the face of the earth, and we didn't. We're making this tower. We're making a name for ourselves. <laughs> We're doing it. How many know that's how humanity thinks? One day goes to another day goes to another day and seemingly nothing happens and they think there is no judgment and they think there is no God and they think there is no right and they think there is no wrong but how many know there's coming a day when they'll know different? These Nimrod represents for us and by representing I mean he is a real historical figure. This is a real thing because it happened in scripture and if anybody tells you and they will try to even professing Christians will say well, Genesis 1 to 11 especially is just kind of, you know, like, mytho it's not mythology. It's not presented that way at all. It's presented as historical fact. And if God presented it that way, who are we to view it differently? Do we think we know more than God? Right? And so here it is. Is it what happened? This is really what happened. This, Nimrod is an unrighteous man. He's an unrighteous rebel. And not only is he unrighteous, but he's unrepentant. And what happens? God looks upon this tower 
and comes. And again, we're not given a timetable, but how many know it could happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye? God sees this tower and sees this rebellion, and we don't know how long he let it go on. It's not as if it escaped his notice. But one day, it, no longer did, it, did he just notice it, but he decided to judge it. And the tower that had taken them, who knows how long to build, crashing down. The people that had joined together in one language, in one moment their languages are confused. These people that had joined together to make a name for themselves, in one moment they're scattered across the face of the earth. How many know God can bring judgment in a moment? Peter refers to this in his epistle when he talks about the patience of the Lord. And he says, people, and basically this is the tenor of what he is sharing, in 2 Peter chapter 3, is that people go about in their life, and one day runs into the next, and it seems that, oh, summer and winter and spring, all this stuff just keeps on happening like it always has, and they assume that every day is going to be just like the day before, until one day it's not. One day God can bring judgment all at once should he choose to do so. But how many know with each individual person it's appointed of the man once to die and then the judgment. And I tell you, Nimrod is not in a good place. He is unrepentant and he is unrighteous. And he doesn't think that judgment is going to come, but judgment does come. Some people might say, and again, some of those that reject God's word, they say, well, how am I supposed to know what it is that God would want or that God would desire? How do I even know that I'm breaking God's word? And how does people that don't know and have never heard anybody open up a Bible and give them a scripture verse, how do, scripture tells us that the heavens even are declaring the glory of God. Scripture tells us that mankind knows what is righteous because God will give man a, a, a conscience and yet they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There is a witness. There is a testimony. Nimrod knew exactly what God had said. These people knew that God had said to disperse. And yet they rebelled. They rebelled against God. And they were unrighteous. And they were unrepentant. And how many know judgment comes to the unrighteous and the unrepentant? They build a tower. Comes crashing down. They had a common language. God dispersed the confused it. They had a common people a group. He dispersed them across the face of the earth. And it can happen in just a moment. That's why it's that we pray that those who know not Christ be convicted of sin and righteousness and of judgment. And that they would yield to that conviction and put trust in the only way of salvation, which is Christ. Now before we move on to the next one again, Nimrod represents for us this kind of ideal. An unrighteous, unrepentant person who doesn't think judgment is coming, but how many know God does judge the unrepentant and unrighteous? He judges. Now, I would tell you, how can this point us to Christ? Because you know many times we go to, when you study here in the Old Testament especially, we look at a man like Nimrod and we learn he's unrighteous, he's unrepentant, and judgment comes. And those are important truths for us to know. But how many know that all of it points us to Jesus? So Jesus said all of Scripture was about him. Can I tell you? Mankind joined together, thinking they can make a name for themselves. You might even say, save themselves. And they build this tower up to heaven. And God brings it down in a moment in judgment. It seems pretty hopeless at the end of the scene, really, there in Genesis chapter 11. Jesus came, and what was it that happened to our Lord and Savior? But he was lifted up, lifted up upon a cross, not for his sins, but for our sins. And he did die. The judgment of God came, came upon Jesus there upon the cross. How many are thankful he bore the wrath of God for you if you're in Christ? He bore that wrath of God, and he came tumbling down, so to speak, kind of like that tower, if you will. He came tumbling down. He was dead. He was buried, but aren't you thankful? Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes on the third day. And these people thought that they would elevate the tower and make a name for themselves. Scripture says in Philippians chapter 2, because Jesus was willing to be humbled and be a man and die on a cross and be a servant, that God has exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus died upon a cross 
But he rose up from the grave, and he has the name that is above every name. And there's salvation in that name. How many are thankful for that? That's Nimrod. Now let's look to the next one that we're going to... I will say I didn't pick them out because all their names start with N. But they do all start with N tonight. There's three of them, and they start with N. You might call it N, N, and N. <laughs> all right, but 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, or Syria, Aram and Syria are synonymous, was a great man with his master and highly respected, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. I looked that up, by the way. Ten talents of silver, that's like 750 pounds of silver. And those shekels of gold, that's 150 pounds of gold. Now, I did take the time to look that up on the Google machine. And in today, depending on, I'm sure, I'm, not, I'm no precious metals expert. I just typed it in there and said, how much is this? We're looking at may, four and five million dollars at the very least, okay? So a lot, a lot of money. Uh, and, and ten changes of clothes. Verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying... And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. Verse 8, It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. That's the prophet of God. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. And stand and call in the name of the Lord his God. And wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so please take a present from your servant now. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. In this manner, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the house of Remen to worship there, and he leans on my hand and I bow myself in the house of Remen. When I bow myself in the house of Remen, the Lord pardon your servant in this manner. He said to him, Go in peace, so he departed from him some distance. Now, if you got lost in the reading there, I encourage you to read it again. But basically, there's this man named Naaman. And he's a head general for, the, uh, for Syria, for Aram. And, but he has leprosy. And the king of Aram that he serves, the king says, uh, uh, because he heard from this, this servant girl in Naaman's house, that there was a prophet of God in Israel. And there was some possibility. I'm sure they didn't have a lot of faith necessarily. But hey, when you got leprosy, leprosy is like... Uh, a, 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 a death sentence. It's a terrible sentence. It's a terrible malady to have. And so you try anything. And so the king of Syria, he says this. He says to Naaman, his top general. He says, take this. 
750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. These 10 changes of clothes. And take this letter from, this, from me, the king, over to the king of Israel. And when you go to the king of Israel, you tell him that you're there and, and you got the leprosy and, and you're to be, you know, here's this letter saying, please, you know, heal him of the leprosy, introduce him to the prophet. Well, when Naaman comes there to the king of Israel, the king of Israel, who is not a godly man at the time, okay, Jehoram, he's not a godly king. He's one of those bad kings, all right? Israel and the northern kingdom didn't have any good kings in, 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 all, of its, in all of its history. And that's just, so I've, I've touched on that another day, but I won't go on into the history tonight. But he goes there, he's, a wicked, he's not a, a godly king. And when he sees this letter, and he sees Naaman with this leprosy, he thinks, the king of Syria, he sends me this letter, wanting me to cure this man of leprosy. I can't cure this. At least he was smart enough to know that. <laughs> a lot of people think, well, maybe I can. <laughs> How many know only God can do something like that? He, and he, even the king says, am I God that I can do something like this? He said, the king of Syria sends me Naaman with leprosy, asking me to do this impossible task, and then he's going to use this as an excuse to have war against me. Because he sent me with all this money, he sent with this letter, and I'm supposed to have him cured of this leprosy, I can't do it. So he's going to come, and he's going to wage war against us. And he's all upset, he tears his clothes. Well, Elisha is the prophet of God. He's a man of God. And he hears about what happened, and he says... You send him to me, and he's going to know that there's a prophet in Israel and that there is a true and living God. And so what happens? Naaman goes, he goes toward Elisha's house. Now, he goes to Elisha's house, and imagine this. When he goes to Elisha's house where Elisha is staying, Elisha doesn't even go see him. Elisha sends a servant out to him. Right? Gehazi, we call him. And you'll find that name as you read all the prophets. He sends a servant out to him. And Naaman... He's a top general. He feels disrespect. I want to talk to the prophet himself. He just sent a servant out to me. But how many know that servant, as long as he did what the master told him to do, as long as he spoke what the master told him to speak, then that word was just as good as Elisha's word itself. And if, he, if Naaman rejected the word of the servant as long as it was really the word of the master, if he rejected the servant, he also rejected the master. Now we know Jesus says similar things in the New Testament. He says, if you reject me, said Jesus, you reject the one who sent me because I only speak the words that the Father has spoken. Do the things the Father would have for me to do. There's a lot of people in this world that think somehow they can serve God. Maybe they wouldn't even say the Father, but that's kind of the thought they have. And yet reject Jesus the Son. Scripture does not give us that possibility. The one who rejects Jesus has rejected God the Father. If you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. People that say that they serve God and yet they reject Jesus, it's an idol that they're serving. It is not the true, genuine God of Scripture. Jesus didn't give us that possibility. And you say, but this and but that, and you can come up with a thousand other things. But don't patronize Jesus. Either he's a truth teller or he's a liar. I say he's a truth teller. Because Scripture says he's a truth teller, right? He's God in the flesh. And so Jesus said similar things. So Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, comes and brings this word and says, well, go down to the river, Jordan. It's a buddy river. And dip there seven times. And if you dip there seven times, you'll be healed of this leprosy. And what does Damon do? He feels, to use the common young folks vernacular, he feels like he's been dissed. Did I say that right? And he feels like he has been disrespected. Dissed. They shorten it. They shorten everything now. Yeah. The text in. He feels like he's been disrespected. Why? Because the prophet himself hasn't come. And he tells me to go to a muddy over. You see, Naaman thought that because of who he was, his standing as a top general. Naaman thought that because of what he had, he got 750 pounds of gold and 150 pound, or 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold. He thinks because of the gift that he can bring that he should earn whatever. He thinks because of who he is, he should earn it. Because of what he has, he should earn it. And then he thinks because of who he knows, the king. Uh, his king, the king of Syria, sent this letter. I should earn this. 
at least to see this man of God and to be healed by some kind of spectacle. Waving his hand off. I can't even see name and kind of had it in his mind's eye. That's the prophet's going to come out and going to wave his hand over the spot. He's got to, you know, because I deserve it. I have earned it. Can I tell you, a lot of people think that. They don't have to be a top general. They don't have to have a 150 pounds of gold, 750 pounds of silver. They don't have to know no king whatsoever of any kind of country that would write them a letter of recommendation. People think that they deserve salvation, that they deserve all kind of good things, that they deserve for their ship to come in, however they think that that is. They think that they deserve it. Do you know what we deserve in and of our own selves as eternal conscious torment in hell? It's what we deserve from all the things that we can add up with our good works. Right. And some folks may say, well, that, that doesn't make me feel good. I, it, listen, how many would far rather be interested in the truth than in feeling? Amen. You felt good about, I remember when I bought my first used car. The man told me I was I was I was so smart because I made the deal of a lifetime. He was charging me like twenty percent interest. <laughs> on the and this is no lie on the thirty first day, thirty first one day past that thirty day as is thing you know, one day past that, the alternator in the car went out. Dad fixed it. I took it back there. I thought for sure the fella gave me some kind of credit. I went down there, and, and he said, been who? <laughs> I've been had. That's what I've been. All right? But I felt good about it at the time. I felt good about it at the time. But it wasn't the truth of the situation. How many here can say there's been things in your life you felt good about at the time? Sin can have somewhat of a pleasure, at least for a season. But do understand this, that there is nothing that is, it is good in and of ourselves. And our feelings can mislead us and misdirect us. And we can feel good about what we should feel bad about. And feel bad about what we should feel good about. We need the truth of the Word of God to set the record straight. And what happened here, this man Naaman, he thought because of who he was, because of what he had, because of who he knew, that he could earn this particular miracle from God. A salvation of sorts, and by salvation, I'm not even talking necessarily spiritual salvation, but salvation from this disease of leprosy. He thought that he could earn that. And yet what does scripture tell us? Our best deeds are as filthy rags before God. Listen. I'm all for, I mentioned it before, I'm all for people doing better and people living better and people talking better. But if, even if you get a man not to cuss and get a man not to drink, smoke, or chew, or hang with those that do, or however you define your morality, if they don't repent and put trust in Jesus, they'll just be cleaner and talk better and still split hell wide open. And here it is. Now listen, don't get me wrong. I'm all for people talking better and <laughs> not getting it. But do understand, that won't save a person. Only Jesus can save. Amen. And here it is. This man thought that he could earn it, but he couldn't earn it. And he's all mad. And you know, that's how the world gets, right? When you give them the instruction from God, give them what God says. Even though it's good. How many know if you've got leprosy and the man tells you to go down and dip seven times and you'll be healed, you would think the first thought to your mind would be, well, let's give it a shot. <laughs> Even if you didn't have a whole lot of faith in it, what I got to lose, right? But that wasn't his first thought. His first thought was anger. He's mad. Who does this man of God think he is? Can I tell you, there's a lot of people think, who does the Bible, what does the Bible think it is? Who does God think he is? Who does a preacher think he is? Who does a believer in Jesus think it? To tell me that somehow my, I can't earn it and I have, I have missed it and I have fallen short and I have sinned. There's anger that rises up. You would think that if they thought it was just a bunch of foolishness that they wouldn't get angry. They just keep on walking on that. But they do. There's something that gets upset. Something that gets angry. You talking to me? Right? And yet can I tell you, thanks be to the Lord, there were some men around him. His servant said, now master, now again, I don't want to add to what scripture says, but in your mind's eye you can kind of see this, right? He's the master and they're the servant. And they come and they say, Master, they call him Father, by the way. They use a very, they use a name for him, calling him Father, like, a, like that they were, that this man had been somewhat good to them, that they kind of had somewhat of a relationship with him. And they say, 
If he had told you to do some great and mighty deed, you'd have done it. You know, if he told you to climb Mount Everest or told you to go through Death Valley, you'd have done it more than as a baggage of courage, something to show yourself that, yes, you really do deserve it. And you would have done it. Since he's just asked you to do this, why don't you do it? The man goes, and he dips seven times in this muddy river. And on the seventh time, he was healed of his leprosy. And I tell you, it is a common phrase that if someone's healed of a skin condition, leprosy in this case, it's a common phrase to say that their skin is like baby skin. Anybody ever had baby? You've seen them? You know, you hold your baby and their skin is so soft. And so here it is, skin is so soft and it's just like a newborn baby. And I will tell you, that would be a phrase to use for a physical healing, but I think there's something more involved here because how many know when it is that we repent and put trust in Christ when we don't trust anymore in our works, but put simple trust in the word of God that we need to repent of our sins and put trust in Christ who can redeem. The one who has, and again, it was one of the best messages on baptism I've heard here. If you haven't listened to it a couple weeks ago, Brother Todd went through a lot of Old Testament imagery and theology and practical outworkings of baptism. But I will tell you, like a baptism, Jesus who was baptized, so to speak, and raised from the dead, he buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, we say to a believer. And here this man, he dips seven times, and then when he comes up, his skin is new. And you say, well, Ben, what, what do you have? What proof do you have that that might have been more than just a physical healing? That might, might have been some kind of spiritual thing because of this. The man, Naaman, when he comes up out of the water, he goes to Elisha. This man that he had ridiculed, this man that he was mad at because he wouldn't even come and give him an audience, he goes back to the man and basically has a repentant attitude and he wants to give Elisha something. Most people that are on your TV would say, oh, the 750 pounds of gold and are of silver and 150 pounds of gold. Oh, yeah, but Elisha, he, wanted, he didn't want a bad witness to be set. He didn't want him to think somehow he bought it. And he said, no, no, you keep it. And Naaman said this. What did he ask for? And, and if we don't study history, we can miss this. It's kind of, it seems like a strange thing, but look back here at verse, uh, verse uh, uh, 17. Naaman said, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. The proper name of God there, Yahweh. All caps, right? And he said here, Behold, I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Okay? So he says, There's no God other than the God of, of Israel. And he says, Let me take two mule loads of earth back with me. Because he was going back to Syria. He said, And when my master offers up sacrifices to this false God, I'm only going to be offering up sacrifices to Yahweh. And why did he take that mule sold it? It sounds like a strange thing, right? Why did he want to take some of the dirt of Israel back to Syria? What difference did that make? Well, here was his thinking. His, the way that they had viewed things back in Syria was if you wanted to worship God, their little g-god, their false god, and any little g, you had to be on their soil. They had territorial gods. They thought God is God over this territory. God is God over this territory. There were little g gods. They had different names of these gods, and they would be territorial. Well, how many know the true and living God? You might say he's territorial. It all belongs to him. <laughs> all right. And he can't be confound to any kind of demarcations that humans could contrive. It says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all it contains. How many know that covers it all? Yeah. Right? And so. Naaman, he says this, he wants to take back this earth with him from Israel because in his way of thinking, now again, he's a little confused perhaps, not that he needed to do this thing, but it shows there was a change in his heart because not only does he say there's only one God, that's the God of Israel. There's only one God, his name is Yahweh. He even uses his proper name there with all the caps in the Lord. But he says, he, by him taking this mule soul of earth, whenever his master went in to worship the false God, he would put part of this earth down and he would say, this is, I'm going to worship the true God of Israel is what it represented to him. Now again, I, there's no need for that, that, to have that dirt, but it meant something to him. And God let it mean something to him because what does the prophet say to him? Go in peace. And that's the word shalom in Hebrew. It says go in peace. Take this, this with you. So when 
uh, Naaman's going to worship now. He's going to worship the true and living God and not the false God. How many are thankful for that? How many know Naaman was unrighteous? He was unrighteous. You say, how do you know he's unrighteous? Because he was breathing. <clears throat> there is none righteous, no, not one. Okay, in and of our own works, none of us are righteous. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. There's none who, who uh, uh, would do what is righteous. And so here it is. Naaman was unrighteous, even though he was a man of esteem and a man of wealth and a man of connections. But none of that could earn his salvation. Simply the grace of God. And the man, though he was unrighteous, unlike, unlike Nimrod, he, Naaman, he was unrighteous, but he was repentant. He was not unrepentant. And instead of the judgment of God remaining upon him, this leprosy, he was cleansed. You say, where did it go? It was gone. <laughs> in the sea. And how many know if we are in Christ, our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west, buried in the depths of the sea to be remembered against us no more. And as Brother Todd pointed out, that that's symbolizing baptism. that Jesus died that our sins might be washed away and he rose from the grave for our justification. How many are thankful for that tonight? So a beautiful picture of his, his skin like that of a newborn baby. And how many are thankful if you're in Christ, you've been born again. You've been born again. Now, so we had uh, Nimrod, the unrighteous, unrepentant, who was judged. We have Naaman, the unrighteous, repentant, who was saved. How many know everybody's one of those two? Amen. Notice both of them start off with unrighteous. But then there's one who's repentant and one who's not. One is judged, one is saved. Now we come to 1 Kings chapter 21. This is with, how many ever heard of King Ahab before? Right? I did a message some months ago called The Worst King Ever. And Ahab is seen as the worst king ever. It says he did more to provoke God's anger than any of the other kings. How many of you don't want that said about you? You don't want it to be on a tombstone. Provoke God's anger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is written in the book for everybody to see for all of, of eternity. Ahab's this terrible, terrible man. Terrible, terrible king. And if he's bad, his wife Jezebel is worse than All right? So here we go. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 1. It came about after these things that Naboth, or Naboth, actually, but Naboth, I'll say Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So obviously the third man's name who starts with the N is Naboth. Okay? So we have Nimrod, Naaman, and Naboth. The Jezreelite, this Naboth, had a vineyard which was beside the palace of Ahab. Verse 2. Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is close beside my house. And I will give you a better vineyard than it in its place. If you like, I will give you the price of it in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Ahab came into his house sullen and vexed because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said to him, how is it that your spirit is so sullen that you are not eating food? So Ahab said to Jezebel, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Verse 7, Jezebel's wife said to him, Do you now reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, and let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent letters to the elders and to the nobles who were living with Naboth in his city. Verse 9. If I can get my clicker to work here. Verse 9. Now she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the people and seat two worthless men before him and let them testify against him saying, You curse God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And that's exactly what they did. And they took over the baby. So, again, if you got lost there in the reading, I encourage you to read it again. I, want, I like to read it out instead of just summarizing things all the time. But I will tell you this. 
If you look back, here's what's happening in this passage. Ahab's a wicked king. His wife Jezebel, she's really wicked. Okay, she's kind of more in control than he is. All right, and uh, but they're both very wicked. And what happens is Ahab wants a vineyard that's close to his palace. He wants it for his own. Well, this man named Naboth owns it. So Ahab, this wicked king, goes to Naboth and says, Give me this vineyard and I'll give you another vineyard in its place. Or, if you don't want another vineyard in its place and you'd rather have money, I'll give you money for it. You decide. You tell me. Naboth says, now if you reread this passage, Naboth doesn't just say, Well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to sell you my vineyard. He says, I'm not going to disobey the Lord and let you have this vineyard. Or sell you this thing. You say, well, did God tell him he couldn't sell it? God told him, not directly, but in his word. If you study the Old Testament, they were not supposed to sell out certain lands of their fathers. And by, if he'd done that, he would have disobeyed the word of God in the Old Testament. And how many know? They, uh, uh, David didn't want to do that. You say, it wasn't just that he didn't want another vineyard. One that he didn't just want to sell. It wasn't like he's just working out a business deal. Ahab couldn't offer him enough money for him to sell it because he didn't want to obey. Uh, he wanted to obey God and not disobey God. How many know we need more people like that? Yeah. Naboth said, no, I'm not going to disobey God by giving this vineyard to you in place of another or by selling it to you. I'm not going to do that. And Ahab, he sold it. He said, oh, I didn't get my vineyard. Jezebel said, we can fix this. You're the king. So she sends out letters and has these two worthless fellows at proclaim a fast and they set the, this festival and they have Naboth sit at the head of the table and these two worthless fellows say, he cursed God and the king. Then they take him outside the city and they stone him to death and then they take over his land. That, how many know that's wicked? Very wicked. And so that's what transpires here. He said, well what does this, we had the, remember Nimrod is the unrighteous, unrepentant who's judged. Then we had uh, Naaman, who's the unrighteous repentant who is saved. Here, when we talked about Naboth, this is the righteous who is killed by the unrighteous. Now, by Naboth, I don't mean to say that he was righteous. He was breathing too. He was unrighteous in and of himself. But in this particular scenario, he represents a righteous man insofar as he wasn't going to do what God had forbade with his land. And yet the king comes to him and says, tempts him, you might say. How many know Jesus was tempted in every way, such as we are, yet without sin? It's pointing us to Jesus, not the name of Jesus, but it's a type and shadow. Because Jesus, when the devil came to him and said, turn these stones to bread that you can eat, he said, no. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan comes to him and says, cast yourself off the temple. God will give his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. He said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Satan shows him all the kingdoms of this world. I'll give these to you if you just bow down and worship me. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. How many are thankful? Jesus did not... I mean, he, he defeated the temptation where the first Adam fell, the second Adam succeeded. And isn't that good news? And he said, there was, there was nothing that could be offered Jesus to get him to disobey in any way, shape, manner, or form. The Word of God, of course, he is the Word of God made flesh and dwelling among us. And here it is, is that what was conspired against David? Ahab and Jezebel weren't just going to let him have his vineyard. They weren't just going to let the righteous... Righteous uh, be okay with that. No. They wanted what they wanted. And what were they going to do? They would have him killed. They had false charges brought up against him. That he spoke against God. And he spoke against the king. When the charges were brought against Jesus. What was the main thrust of them? The Jews said he has blasphemed our God. And blasphemed our temple. And by the way. When Pilate wanted to release him. He said. He makes himself out to be a king. Anyone who makes himself out to be a king is no friend of Caesar. So basically, what did they say against Jesus? He's spoken against God, and he's spoken against the king. What did they do? This name, now, were the charges true against David? No. Were the charges true against Jesus? No. But what did they do? These two worthless men, they testified falsely against Naboth. How many know Jesus had false witnesses against him as well? And then what did they do? But they took Naboth outside the city. How many know they took Jesus outside? Now they crucified Jesus and they stoned Naboth. So it's not a perfect 
a type and shadow, but it is a type and shadow, little bit, but that points us to Jesus, the sacrifice of someone who is righteous, seemingly being killed by the unrighteous. How many know? It's always something. I read the book of Acts and I see Paul standing before all these Roman officials. How many know they were wicked people he was standing in front of? But you want to see even a greater disparity between righteousness and unrighteousness. No greater disparity could there be than Jesus standing before Pilate or before the religious authorities or before Herod. Between his righteousness and their wickedness, how many know the disparity was as great as the disparity could ever be? And he's there before them. It looks as if when Jesus dies, and notice Jesus dies with two worthless fellows on both sides of him. And they're saying when Jesus begins to be crucified, both of these worthless fellows are hurling insults at him. Now during the hours that they were upon the cross, how many are thankful? There was one who was a Nimrod. He was unrighteous and unrepentant and no doubt judged. But there was one who was a Naaman who repented and put in trust in Christ and said, Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And how many are thankful that Amen. Jesus said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. And so here it is, Naboth, there's two worthless men. And Jesus, he's hung between two worthless men. Naboth dies. Ahab takes over his vineyard. Ahab, what we judge, he'll literally go to the dogs. You can keep reading there. Fine, that's true. All right. As will his family. Keep reading there, you'll see. They die, the dogs lick up their blood in the same place where it was that Naboth's blood was spilled. But Naboth, he dies. And Naboth goes to the grave. But the one to whom he pointed, Jesus, who is truly the capital R righteous one, he died, but he didn't stay in the grave. Amen. He rose again with life and liberty to all who believe. The righteous was killed by the unrighteous, so it seemed, but it was according to the predetermined plan of God. And scripture says, had they known not only the uh, physical powers of the day, but even more importantly, the spiritual powers, so to speak, of the day, had they known that the cross upon which they thought he would die is a place where he made an open show of them, and that he would rise again, and though they bruise his heel, he would press their head. Justice had been said all the way back in that book of Genesis. It's true stuff. Amen. He rose again from the dead, the righteous that the unrighteous might be forgiven, that those who would be Naaman's and not Nimrod would be forgiven, who would put their trust in him. How many are thankful Jesus rose from the dead? So we have these three, Nimrod, Naaman, Naaman, Nimrod, unrighteous, unrepentant, judge, Naaman, unrighteous, repentant, saved, Naaman, the righteous, dying at the hands of the unrighteous, but pointing us to Jesus who rose from the grave with life and liberty for all who would believe. Aren't you thankful tonight? Amen. Let's stand our feet. Father, we come before you tonight, and we do thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord, these Old Testament passages that point us to Christ in the new. And Lord, how anyone could read such a book and not... Lord, Lord I, I pray that your spirit would convict hearts and minds that through all of its pages, pointed us to Christ and pointed us to the need for repentance, pointed us to his sacrifice that paid the price for our salvation, pointing us to the salvation that's found in Him alone. Pointing out the pride of man, but pointing out the glorious forgiveness that's found through the shed blood of Christ. Lord, tonight, if there be any that know not Christ, Lord, apart from Christ, we are all unrighteous. Our good deeds can't earn it, no matter how great one may be in the eyes of this world or how much one may have or how who it is that we may know apart from knowing Christ there is no salvation and if there is anyone here tonight that knows not Christ I pray they will be convicted of sin righteousness and of judgment know that there is judgment coming like there was for Nimrod so there is it's appointed to each uh, once to die and then the judgment there's no purgatory there's no second chance after the afterlife so to speak Lord, if there's anyone here that's not repented and put trust in Christ, I pray your spirit would convict them and that indeed by your grace and for your glory they would be like Naaman who in humility would repent and obey the word of God to put trust in Christ alone for salvation. 
And I pray if there's any here in that situation tonight that they, by the power of your spirit, will come in something like this. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. You, Jesus, are the only Savior. Make me your child. Lord, for those who are your children, we rejoice that Christ, the only righteous one, died and yet rose again that we might be forgiven, that we might be born again, that indeed our flesh, so to speak, spiritually speaking, we might be like a newborn child, Lord, in the kingdom of God. We thank you and rejoice that our sins are cleansed by his blood and cast as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, we come before you tonight. Before we leave this place, we lift up prayers requests to you tonight. Lord, I thank you that Dad's in church. His appointment follow-up today went well. Pray you just continue to bless and strengthen him, dear God. Lord, we lift up to you tonight, Lord, uh, Steve, uh, Ken and Joe's cousin, passed away here on Sunday or Monday, and we prayed for his family, for Eileen, his wife, and for other family of which we don't know all the names, but we pray that you would minister to them, that those that know not Christ would would be convicted and come unto him for forgiveness and for comfort, and that those who do know you of the family will find comfort and strength in you, their Savior. Lord, we lift up to you tonight these relatives of, of uh, Danny and Michelle where there's been tragedies here in these recent days, and we pray that they would turn unto you and that your strength and power would be extended to them. Lord, we lift up to you tonight our Brother Dave, and we pray for your power and your healing virtue to be extended, dear God, to our dear brother. Lord, we pray you would move and minister on his, on his behalf and bless him and strengthen him. Lord, we pray for Carla, Lord Brother Todd's mom up in Virginia. We pray your healing power and virtue to be extended to her wisdom, to be sure, for the doctors and nurses. But we pray, Lord, that you would do what only you can do. Lord, we lift up to you this upcoming conference, dear God, of the street preaching ministry that's coming up here in the next couple weeks. We pray that you would already, as we know that you are and trust that you are, prepare hearts and minds to be strengthened and encouraged. And Lord, to proclaim your truth and to be used by you. And we pray, dear God, that you would move and help in all the preparation, no doubt, that goes into such an event. Lord, we lift up to you, Nick, Lord Mark and Rachel's son. We lift him up to you. Thank you. He's been somewhat more receptive here of late. We pray your hand would be upon him and that you would draw him unto yourself and the truth of your word would be blazoned into his heart and into his mind and that seeds that are planted would come to fruition, dear God. We pray you would draw him unto yourself and that he'd repent and put trust in Christ. And we pray that for all our lost loved ones and Lord, for those that we would meet in our workplace and in our lives, Lord, we pray that you would use us to be witnesses of yours and of your truth and that you would draw men and women unto salvation, dear God. Lord, we lift these requests before your almighty throne and we pray, Lord, that you be glorified thereby. Lord, we lift up this co-worker of Benjamin's, Lord, the... Uh, uh, Mark is his name, if I remember correctly, who stands in need of healing. And his wife, Cheryl, we pray that you would move. I don't know if they know you or not. If they don't, we pray certainly for salvation, most importantly. But we pray for your healing hand to be extended to them as well, and that you would be glorified thereby. We pray for your hand extended to this situation. Other requests that are on the list or that are known only to hearts and minds, we pray you minister as only you can by your grace and for your glory. And may we, your people, not fail to give you all the praise, for you're worthy of it all, Lord. Lord, in the midst of a world that, Lord, gets so excited and so consumed by things that are temporary at best and perhaps sinful at worst, Lord, we, your people, we pray that we will be more and more enamored, I don't know is the right word, but that we will be more and more, uh, Lord, concerned about the things of you and that we would grow more and more excited and, and uh, uh, Lord, just motivated by the things of you and of your spirit and of your word. Individually and collectively, we pray. 
in that mighty matchless name of Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we pray in that name and in the power of the Spirit we come and all of God's people said, May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. May you know it is the hope you're called of God in Christ Jesus and the surpassing greatness of His power extended to all who believe. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. I will say quickly, I know I didn't make announcements earlier on tonight, but a couple. One Saturday in about uh, 7 or so. If you're available, we're we'll be doing the roof. The weather looks clear. God had other plans those other days for whatever reason, but this Saturday looks clear, and so if you're available and have tools, that's this Saturday. And then in the fellowship hall tonight, we got in a, a big, uh, several boxes of various meats. There's chicken and burger and steak and all sorts of things that uh, will be put out over there tonight. So please go over there and look. We got a whole fridge full that it needs a home. So God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Daddy.